All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for thank you for coming to class in this heat. Um, and so today we're going to continue after the weekend on our uh, fourth talk on quality. So um, yes, quality is a big topic because. Um, um, this is why we really the focus of why we're all here about why we're doing health services research, why we're interested in studying uh, the collection and processes, inputs, structure um, and outcomes. It's mainly to answer a universal challenge, which, you know, a question that no one really has cracked it yet, which is what is a good quality service and how do we make our services um, you know, of good quality and better quality? Yeah, so this is what it's all about. You know, it hasn't changed. Uh, where, what we're trying to do, whether we're, wherever we are in the system, whether we are, you know, at the level of the micro, meso, and macro, whether we are a purchaser, a provider, or a regulator, uh, whatever player you are in the system, it's all about how do we run it? How, how should we run it? Should we use this system, that system? Why are there so, so many different ways of running the health, health service? What's it all about? We just want to have the best quality within the resources available. So high quality care at the least cost. Because we know there isn't never enough money, never enough resources. And also, if we have put more money in, we know that there's always more that can be done. We looked about, you know, the we talked about um, looked at the, the, the era of cost containment, the era of you know, expansion, cost containment, and now the era of accountability. Because from experience, we've known that. The more money we put in, the more ways there are to do different things. We have more demand, more expectations, more suppliers, more doctors offering services. So how do we qualify quality and give high quality care to our patients um, in the least cost? Good question. So you remember in, from the introduction, we talked about what high quality care should look like. And we talked about the different dimensions of uh, quality. And the first of all, then, we, we will remember that a high quality service would provide care that is safe. So to do the sick, no harm, Florence Nightingale said. And so really, you want to go into healthcare no worse than you come out. And that is really what one, one, one very important of a dimension of, of quality is, is, is safe. Okay. Afterwards, you remember that we want to make it effective, make it do some good. You want to come out better than how you get got in. That would be universally quite accepted. That uh, it should be effective. You come out feeling better, essentially. Then we have humanity. Humanity is, remember, quite hard to define, but essentially is treating people with respect and also a timely, in a timely way. Um, so the WHO does classify as responsiveness of a service, and there are different ways of explaining humanity. Some um, countries look at patient experience. Um, essentially, is having the dignity uh, that people should 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 come should go into uh, uh, um, and 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 receive a service and be be reasonably um, treated, basically how you want to be treated if you were the patient. And finally, equity, equitable. Fair, fair in a way that's based on clinical need rather than other characteristics, um, so social variables like age, like your sex, gender, etc., etc. And so I think you know we we can establish that if if there are these four domains dimensions of quality, um, then uh, it would really uh, help us uh, look at um, the service in, in a holistic way. Um, so we must remember that efficiency, the ratio, is a ratio of the quality to cost, is not in the equation of quality, okay? It's not one of the dimensions. Because efficiency talks about cost, it's a kind of sort of economic way. Anything like productivity means that you put cost into your quality equation, and then you can't then balance uh, quality with cost. So when just to remember that, you know, essentially, you can have a very high quality service that is not efficient. Now, policymakers don't want that, but you can have really high quality in the four dimensions we talked about: safe, effective, humane, equitable. Just that you, you know, it, it's not in a way that it, that you want, you want to pay for, you want to be able to um, afford. So, efficiency is something else. Okay. 
But really, what we are aiming to do is have care that's provided in a way that ensures the greatest benefit for the least costs. So this would be what we are up to, do, to, to, to doing. But it's a trade-off. We can't really have uh, maximized all the dimensions of, of quality. So an example of how it's a trade-off is that we know that PCI centers and stroke units are good uh, to more centralized services for these conditions. So if you put patients into a big center, it's very effective. So we've up effectiveness. But then that means geographically, not everyone can have a hospital very close by. So you restrict equity. So equity and effectiveness here is a balance, is a trade-off. You can't really have both. So one more dimension of quality that I mentioned that's increasingly important is sustainability. Um, and sustainability with the current climate change um, debates, we know that it would be increasingly important. But actually, prior studies have, there have been very few qualifying health services, but it is a huge impact. I think in, you know, in my introduction talk, there was a sort of rough figure that in the United States, you know, health services accounts for about eight to 9% of all the carbon that's generated. Uh, so that's quite significant. There are some pioneering studies that have started to look at, look at only look at the um, impact of health services on carbon footprint. For example, um, so having primary angioplasty centers has in increased carbon emissions by 3.2.4 uh, 3 times um, compared to if you had thrombolysis in the past where you can just go to your local center. So we've increased effectiveness and a trade-off for um, sustainability. But mobile breast screening has decreased um, less car use and less carbon uh, footprint. So I think increasingly, this, it will become more important to balance um, our high quality services, but also making sure that it's environmentally sustainable. Okay, so rapid overview of what the dimensions of quality is. The next bit is, how should we, um, so we, we know the dimensions of quality, but how do we manage it? Because this is what we're all about. Well, essentially, there are three stages we need to um, know in, in order to study um, our health services. So three stages of managing quali high qual uh, quality. First of all, we have to define what uh, good quality care is. So we select our dimensions. Uh, we need to understand uh, what, what it is, what we mean, what define it. And then uh, I'll go more into that. And then we start to assess it. So look at it and study it which is what our research is mostly all about. Um, what aspects of it, dimensions of it, all of it. Um, and then we look at how do we improve it. Okay. So, defining good quality. First of all, we have to select a topic. We can't look at everything uh, at once. Um, so we select usually either uh, uh, clinical guidelines or um, uh, an area of service. We select a topic. Um, we define what this good quality is afterwards by establishing a criteria. Essentially, it's a statement of what good, good is. And so we know about guidelines. So we know lots of different places have guidelines. Um, and so we have a statement of what we think a good quality service is. And then we set a standard. A standard is the extent of which our service or our clinical um, um, guidelines should adhere to you know, the, the percentage that everyone should be doing it, essentially. A proportion of people should be doing it to having it. This, this is what good looks like. So everyone uh, should have um, uh, 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 um, a, uh, uh, everyone, how many people should be at a PCI center by what time. Um, would be uh, the, the standard. Every, uh, how people should be uh, sent to a, a primary angioplasty for their heart attacks would be uh, the criteria. And you say, if we say 70% is, is good, would be the standard. And then afterwards, we can do the quality assessment, which is measuring it. So we measure how many people actually get there, EMS services, how much time it takes to get the patient uh, to the hospital, and then we do the quality improvement. So we say, ah, we measured it. And we say, actually, only less people or more people than expected that we set the standard to um, have reached it. So ah, we want 70% of all um, of our patients reaching hospitals uh, within 90 minutes, but actually only 60% did. So then we 
has set an intervention to improve it. Uh, more um, more uh, cars needed, ambulances needed, maybe more um, uh, the paramedics need to be trained, something uh, along how you improve it. And then you go back and set the standard again. So it's an iterative cycle. So this is called the uh, quality improvement cycle. Uh, many places uh, use this. So essentially, you can see defining good quality, assessing quality, and improving quality. OK, so how do we define good quality care stage one? It's challenging uh, for practitioners and managers. And I think we just need to be mindful that it's challenging because care is complex. And models simplify um, you know, how complex life is. Um, if we look at a, an aspect of a service, there's so many facets. Last week, we looked at the dynamics between prof, um, health pr professionals and uh, the, the um, autonomy of health professionals and then the different health professionals at, in, into play. We looked at the relationship between the clini clini clinicians and patients um, and the agency relationship. But there are lots of other aspects as well that care is very complex. Um, <clears throat> and so, OK, um, we know that also there's a lot and a lot of uh, scientific evidence that is um, now available. Um, and all, there are really only marginal gains now. We know that you know, the difference is when you do um, <clears throat> uh, a cost effectiveness analysis between treatment A and treatment P, it's getting smaller and smaller with 5% margins. Uh, very little quantum leaps. I think the days, the eras of, you know, when penicillin was discovered and everyone was getting cured from the infectious diseases, has um, has has gone. Perhaps we wait for like genomics cancer treatments for the next quantum leap. But at the moment, we're really looking at a slightly better drug against a, 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 a an ever so slightly you know standard treatment. So really, it's getting um, harder to tell you know, what the benefits, usefulness are. And also we have tons and tons of research, um, scientific research out every day. There's about like, I think rough scan, 20,000 biomedical journals. Um, and now there's also online publishing. So you can really have open access, which is great, but actually um, just to, for us to be mindful that practitioners, clinicians, and managers have very little time to understand what this best practice. So we need summarized information in the form of guidelines. Japan have their own guidelines. Yeah. And uh, of, uh, your country, yes. so, so good. Different, lots of different places have their own guidelines. Um, so this is some pictures of guidelines from uh, England. Lots already exist. And usually these are produced by governments, health professional associations, health insurance companies international agencies, and also for different levels of treatment. So my, micro is like a best drug to use to treat a disease, diabetes disease, what, um, uh, what you should be having as a first line treatment, second line treatment, cancer therapy, what's the first cycle? So we're all familiar with the micro um, level of clinical practice, clinical guidelines. Um, then we have the meso level on how best to organize a service. So for example, for diabetic care, how do you organize that service? Um, how do we provide better healthcare? And this is the level we're all working in, really. We're, we're wanting to know how to run organized services to provide better care. But all of this needs to be scientific evidence combined with informed treatment. And, um, it's mind, you know, for us to be mindful that scientific science evidence alone isn't doesn't form the everything of guidelines. Um, it's a combination of context, cost funding. Um, in the last talk, you saw that you know three countries: UK, Canada, and the States choose different ages and different populations to screen for AAA for their abdominal aortic aneurysms. They use the same scientific evidence, but what's deferred is their informal ju informed judgment, the context, the consensus of experts. So some of us may have heard of Delphi measures, uh, surveys, um, group techniques, consensus development. So different countries have different practices and also a willingness to pay threshold. Some countries will um, spend this much and feel that that's worth the cost for, you know, this is worth us spending this much resources on this. So guidelines are developed and slightly vary between different countries and they're usually country specific. So in England, the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, 
lovely acronym, NICE guidelines. So it's quite famous, probably if you've heard of it. Um, produces NICE clinical guidelines, uh, service pathways, and quality standards for lots of services. Also in England, professional bodies like the Royal College of Physicians, you might have seen there um, some of the guidelines as well. Um, physicians and surgeons, um, specialist associations, etc., produce guidelines. So you might know internationally the WHO also has guidelines um, to support lower middle income countries um, to help develop um, important clinical areas and pathways. Okay, so that's how we define quality. Now, stage two, assessing quality. We then need to select the appropriate method. And as we remember of the four different dimensions of quality, um, there are different ways of looking at, you know, you can choose to look at different aspects, different dimensions of quality, um, but there are different methods we need. Um, and quantitative health surveys alone um, only really gives us uh, the service of the data. And for us just to be mindful of that, for some, we really like humanity. We, a, a survey would only give you a, a scra scraping the surface, a reductionist approach. Um, but what we really want to go on, we go, go more in depth. We probably do need some qualitative surveys, so such as focus groups. So for, for safety, we can use case record review uh, to look at uh, how quality is. Adverse event reporting, many clinicians are used to doing that. So nurses have to report in, in an adverse incident. Um, doctors too, if there was a near miss, if you've got a surgery in the wrong leg, you know, now actually that was reported. Yes, yeah, like right kidney, left kidney. So now, um, you know, we realize we can't do that. The doctor now needs to go and mark the kidney, put a big, big permanent marker on the leg that needs to be operated on and don't, don't open the, the, the good leg and leave the fracture. Um, critical instant inquiry, that's qualitative, a deep dive into what went wrong. Um, when there's really poor quality care, usually when there's a, you know, we call them MMM meetings, there's not chocolate in, <laughs> in England, um, mor morbidity and mortality meetings, where you review you know, cases who have them, um, are complicated and who've um, um, led to mortality. Usually there's a, so there's a, so there's a review. And then um, there are also um, um, various forms that it might, you might think about your own examples from in your country. Effectiveness, we have clinical databases in the form of clinical audits um, or cohort studies um, from areas. Um, and also uh, equity, if you want to look at fairness, we, we can get it from routine data and government records. Okay, so let's have a look at um, how England looks at safety, the aspect of safety. There's lots of um, uh, official statistics. Uh, safety is a really important core dimension. Um, so since a long, long time, there's a huge, uh, you know, many high income countries do this, but in England, there's a long tradition of capturing a lot of safety um, data and a lot of it is routinely collected now. So there's official statistics. We've got a standardized hosp hospital mortality in, um, index. So by NHS Digital, National Health Service. Um, and then we've also got some commercial, commercial statistics um, as well uh, that uh, private companies have started um, and are widely used. Uh, then we also have avoidable deaths, which NHS England uses. Hospital acquired infection. This was a huge, huge headline making um, newspaper, um, uh, making um, lots of um, news a few years ago when we had lots of MRSA uh, bacteremia in hospitals. And so there's been a large, a huge effort to prevent it. But uh, C. diff is also problematic. So Public Health England does routine measures of any critical um, health care acquired infections. And also uh, emergency readmissions. So uh, within a certain number of days is considered unsafe if they've been discharged and it had to, to be readmitted to hospital for the same reason, for example. And NHS Digital also measures that. We have complications <laughs> studies, patient safety incidents, which I mentioned already. Then we're also collecting patients' views on safety, but that you know, got, got moves on to humanity as well and staff views on safety, um, et cetera, et cetera. Assessing effectiveness, and I think you know, personally, I'm most interested, inst interested in this because my research is also how do we look at effectiveness. Um, but it's also the, one of the most challenging. How do we measure it? 
And one of the ways which this course also uses is um, a nice uh, framework uh, to do is we can measure in three ways. First of all, inputs, structures. Um, it's nice and easy and cheap. A lot of lower middle income countries use a structure to me measure effectiveness. Essentially, is, is the service available? What are the inputs of the service? How many doctors are there? How many nurses are there? Have you got the facilities? Is there how many health centers is in, the, in the village or some, uh, for example? The next easiest is processes. Uh, we, we can measure how much activity we're doing. We are making the assumption that the more we do, and that the, effect, the activity we're doing is good for the patient. Um, so are pe people getting the treatment? Are people getting the drug? How many people are getting treatment? How long the waiting time is? So these are process measures. It's easier and cheaper to measure um, than outcomes. Um, and you know, we will assume that there is a positive linear correlation, uh, positive relationship with outcome. Okay, and then essentially complex and expensive. And my second talk will be um, on patient reported outcomes as well. So I'll go into more introduction on that, but essentially outcomes is what we're, we, we're, we're interested in for effectiveness. Um, we want to know if the patient is better. Um, are they surviving more, for example? Is the quality of life better? Is their health status better? And which outcomes are better? Is treatment A better than treatment B? Is hospital A better than hospital B? Essentially, that's what we're about. So what is the result uh, is outcomes. So let's look at some examples of how um, a study, a study uh, this is a WHO World Health Surveys on how, um, uh, on effectiveness. So um, they have used um, inputs in understand um, thing, how, how safe the service is. They're measuring quality. Uh, of a facility in 18 African countries. So the bottom line, facility has water on the site nearby. Facility has no visible waste. Delivery room has soap and running water. Delivery room has a box for shops disposable. So essentially this is inputs. You know, is, it, is, is there this, this, is this uh, facility available? Is this facility not available? Is there a, um, a, a, a soap and running water for maternal services, um, or um, essential, et cetera, et cetera. So structure, uh, nice and easy to measure. You just need to go in and, oh yes, yeah, so tick, okay, yeah, uh, water, yeah, okay, yeah. Ah, stops box, yeah, done, okay, has water, okay. So it's uh, easy and straightforward to do. This is an example of using processes to look at effectiveness. So basically, they're looking at, has the, uh, for maternal services in this case, women been offered uh, a service uh, where women between 18 and 69 given a pelvic exam? Did the provider tell the women to come back if they, if they were bleeding after the delivery? Um, did the provider tell the caregiver uh, if the child has illness what the danger signs are? The provider took the child's temperature with a thermometer. So again, we're measuring has this been offered, has this been done? So this is an example of measuring effectiveness and the dimension of quality, a process measure. Okay, so when you next look at someone assessing quality, whatever data you're given um, or survey results, you can think about, oh, what, what dimension of quality are they looking at? Is it safety? Is it effectiveness? What, um, what level of, um, of the model are they using? Are they using inputs? Are they using processes? Uh, are they using outcomes? So that's quite nice to frame our thoughts when we next look at research data. So in England, um, like uh, it's very, it's been popular to use uh, to look at uh, effectiveness with a measure of combination of quality and outcomes with national clinical audits. And you can see that lots of high income countries are similar to the NHS, very interested in measuring. We're in an era of accountability um, and, and assessment. So we like to measure, we try to measure how effective our services is. We've got lots and lots of clinical audits. Um, a lot of it is funded by NHS England um, and uh, it's called the Audits and Patient Outcome Program. Majority of it measures processes uh, and also mortality because uh, patient reported outcomes are much harder to capture. But you can just see that there, there are lots. 33 
nationally funded and 20 other funding sources. So 50 different national clinic audits, and this is across the entire country. You might think about in your own country, whether you are familiar, there are national clinical audits and whether or not there are just as many or even more, or maybe they're in development, that they're becoming more, more common um, in the sense that a lot of governments are trying to assess what are we doing to our patients and is care effective. Okay, so how do we compare? Okay, it's good enough measuring it and assessing it. How do we compare? And um, Jia Sensei asked this question, really good question after the, our introduction. And yes, how do we compare? And it, it's very challenging indeed. So why is it challenging? Essentially, there are three reasons why it's challenging. Data completeness. How much missing data is there? Just probably missing data. Who is missing? Um, What's missing? Why is it missing, essentially? So we always have to remember the framework I gave you when we look at data, think of the reasons why. Um, statistical factors, demand factors, and supply factors. So look at the data completeness. Do, do we think it's, it's a complete picture? Secondly, data validity. Are we using the same definitions, diagnosis? Are we comparing you know, apples and, and pears? Or are we comparing the same thing? Uh, sometimes the thresholds are different as well. So, you know, the best care for you know, what we provide for, we say, good is in one country or in one region, there might be a different definition for what good care looks like. So just to be mindful of those, you know, are we, is the data valid? Are we using the same comparators? Data reliability. Are the observations reliable? And really this is saying, are they recorded in a systematically different way? Is there any systematic bias? Ooh, is there any intentional gaming? If we know that there are hospitals that, you know, wanting to compare with each other and they're providing for audit, are they observa observing and collecting information in a consistent manner, basically? And finally, this is most important, it's case mix adjustments. To make a meaningful comparison, we need to ask the question, are we comparing similar patients and cases? Is it a fair comparison? So sometimes you know, we think the comparisons might be confounded and there might be legitimate confounding factors. If people are more, more, more severe cases in one region of hospital, people are older, for example. So that's a, that's a relatively easy to adjust confounder. But what about severity, comorbidity? So, Lots of places start, try to do some case mix adjust, uh, adjustments, um, and which is basically using statistics and clinical characteristics uh, to risk adjust for the differences that we see. But mindful that we can only do that for confounders we know about. We don't know um, there are unknown confounders. There's only so much we can we can do. Measuring um, severity, for example, is rather difficult, um, and also. Uh, comorbidity um, is patchy. Sometimes it's very well recorded. Sometimes it's from routine records where people try to pick uh, disease diagnosis, which is difficult. Um, sometimes it's self-reported, um, and you can see the challenges there. Okay. Assessing quality. Let's look at humanity, patient experience. Uh, for humanity, patient surveys is very uh, common and popular in England. Uh, the NHS inpatient survey here, uh, and the GPPS, which GP patient survey, uh, both are quite large. The GP patient survey is every, uh, everyone who's registered to a GP randomly selective sample is sent out every year like to, to one point something million people. Um, and, and everyone gets posted a survey um, and people can return it. At one point, there's something called friends and family tests a simple questionnaire after you've had a, uh, a treatment uh, in hospital to ask you if you would recommend uh, this hospital or this care to your friends and family um, as a kind of star rating. So people want to try to do that. I mean, lots of different ways of trying to assess patients' experience um, with uh, you know, varying um, different methods, varying success rates holistically, like the friends and family test, which is just an overview like when you go to a hotel, you score it out of 10 or something. And then um, 
to the very more detailed ones like the patient survey to ask you exactly how your contact with your general practitioner was, um, how did your, um, how long your, your consultation was, much more detailed in-depth questions as well. So a variety of them. And we know there's also complaints procedures um, and, and to try to um, f understand patient experience overall. Um, and there are much more qualitative ones like in local in the trust and also uh, locally collected in the trust and also uh, nationally as well in England. So you can probably think about in J Japan or your own country what's, what it's like. Okay, so this is from the same data, from the WHO data. They tried to also look at humanity patient experience in the maternity provide, uh, uh, services, so uh, lower middle in income countries. So this is an example of what they asked in the survey. There was the caregiver able to choose the child's provider, for example. So these are examples of questions you would ask um, to, to assess uh, dignity, respect the patient received. Uh, the humanity aspects of it. Uh, provider was told to caregiver the child's diagnosis and the facility has a system to obtain patient's opinions. The provider asked if the patient had any questions. Um, so again, looking at processes and how the patient may have uh, experienced them. Finally, um, it's um, important for us to consider the level of comparison. Okay, so we can look at um, it on a macro level, the WHO does that, the Commonwealth Health Fund does that, lots of other com levels uh, like such as the OECD countries compare different things. So this is the macro level across uh, internationally, across systems, uh, sometimes nationally as well. So maybe your, your country may have a national report, uh, national clinic audits in England does it at a system level for nationals. And then we've got a meso level where we're looking at the institution. Um, for example, you have hospital standardized mortality ratio and you compare the differences between different hospitals um, or in your own hospital. Um, that's in the meso level of an organization. And then we have micro level when we're going a little bit deep uh, into looking at within the different aspects of service within the organization, um, guidelines, survival rates in a diabetic pathway, for example, uh, cancer pathway, uh, lots of those. Um, so just to think about what is the level of comparison, uh, being mindful that you've, you've consciously chosen or consciously looking at, at that level. Okay.